I would like to this morning turn your attention to the word of the Lord. I'm going to read from 1 Samuel chapter 11. I've been so blessed by the preaching of the word of God. I, I could have just listened and listened and listened. And uh, honestly, preaching in the middle of all this, you just don't even feel worthy to preach in the middle of such great preaching. Uh, but uh, one of the things Brother Robinette said coming into this meeting, and it was such a word from the Lord, he said, such as I have, give I thee. And so today I will try to, if there's anything I have, I'd like to give it to you. First Samuel chapter 11, beginning with verse 1. Then Nahash the Ammonite came up and encamped against Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh said unto Nahash, Make a covenant with us and we will serve thee. And Nahash the Ammonite answered them, On this condition will I make a covenant with you, that I may thrust out all your right eyes and lay it for a reproach upon all Israel. And the elders of Jabesh said unto him, Give us seven days' respite, that we may send messengers unto all the coasts of Israel. And then if there be no man to save us, we will come out to thee. Then came the messengers to Gibeah of Saul, and told the tidings in the ears of this people. And all the people lifted up their voices and wept. And behold, Saul came after the herd out of the field. And Saul said, What aileth the people that they weep? And they told him the tidings of the men of Jabesh. And I want you to notice these next couple of verses. The Spirit of God came upon Saul. When he heard those tidings and his anger was greatly kindled. And he took a yoke of oxen and hewed them in pieces and sent them throughout all the coasts of Israel by the hands of messengers, saying, Whosoever cometh not forth after Saul and after Samuel, so shall it be done unto his oxen. And the fear of the Lord fell on the people, and they came out with one consent." would like to also read to you from the book of Proverbs chapter 14. And I want to read one verse of scripture from the 14th chapter of the book of Proverbs, verse 4. Proverbs 14, 4. Where no oxen are, the crib is clean, but much increase is by the strength of the ox. And I would like to speak this morning as we open up our Friday session with this subject, strong as an ox. Strong as an ox. Lord, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the gathering of your people. And we pray today that your word would have free course. Lord, we are finite, you are infinite. We are lowly, you are high and lifted up. And I pray that today you will anoint the preaching of your word. Not for our glory, but for your glory. And I pray, Lord, that each and every one of us would leave today with understanding. Understanding you would have us to have. Make us who you want us to be. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Everybody said, in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. amen. And amen. God bless you. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. Allow me to just mention the a little, a little history. Um, in the early 1960s, the United Pentecostal Church commissioned a radio uh, broadcast. A radio broadcast was uh, like a podcast <laughs> that was on the radio and you had to wait till it was scheduled to come on. And that's some ancient history, some uh, antiquity there for you. But the, the broadcast was deemed necessary by the United Pentecostal Church International because they felt the need to reach, and, and the, the, the tagline of this particular broadcast was reaching every nation with Bible salvation. And so they did. They, they commissioned a radio broadcast. My grandfather preached. My grandmother sang. And uh, the Calvary Tabernacle Choir, Brother Carson, sang. And, and uh, 
And it was just a wonderful broadcast. The, the name of it was Harvest Time. Harvest. Anybody remember Harvest Time? Amen. Amen. God bless you, Brother Churchill. And uh, it, was, uh, it was a special thing, and it, and it went on for almost, if not, if not right at 40 years, maybe a little over 40 years. And it reached the islands, it reached the nations, it reached the villages, and people would tune in to harvest time in the mornings. A lot of Sunday mornings, people would get ready for church and they would listen to harvest time. And the preaching of the gospel would, would waft through the, the homes as, as harvest time was played. And Grandpa would preach and uh, Grandma would sing and uh, Grandpa would preach Jesus. And he would, he would lift high the name of Jesus. And it was, it was really such a beautiful thing. And uh, my grandmother would sing. Now, I could do an impersonation. I could actually have a, whole, I could have a whole broadcast for you right here and now if you'd like. I could do Brother Rose. I could do Grandma. I could do Grandpa. I could do the whole thing for you right now. <laughs> I will tell you. I will tell you. I will tell you, I was telling a story one time that involved an impersonation. I was at a table full of ministers, and I was just about ready to get to impersonate Grandpa Urshan, and a lightning bolt struck the concrete outside the window where I was sitting. And I opened my mouth not again. I uttered not another word. I didn't know if it was God or Grandpa, but either way, it, it unnerved me. <laughs> But they would sing and they would preach and they would lift their voice. And people, reports of people, truck drivers pulling over to the side of the road and repenting of their sins and receiving the Holy Ghost in, their, in the cabs of their trucks and finding a United Pentecostal church and being baptized in Jesus' name and, and, and later going on to become pastors. A rocket scientist became one of our great pastors from listening to Harvest Time. And on and on the stories go. The song opened as grandfather, Grandpa would finish preaching. Grandma would come on to the, the broadcast singing, Harvest time, harvest time. The grain is falling. The Savior's calling. Oh, do not wait. It's growing late. Behold, the fields are white. It's harvest time. And this is a part of our history, but, but it's a part of our present day as well. Because it's still harvest time. The grain is still falling. The spirit is still calling. And we still cannot wait. It is growing late. Behold, the fields are white. It's harvest time. God is interested in harvest. We have heard reference after reference. The call of the spirit in this particular meeting. A call to the harvest. A call to the field. And as Brother Bounds said so eloquently last night, the fields, plural. Called to the fields to thrust in the sickle, to, to bring about the great harvest of God. It is now. It's not four months and then. It is now. It's not when you turn 20 or 21. It is now. It is not when you get invited to preach. It is now. It's not when somebody recognizes your potential. It is now. The harvest is now. The harvest is now. Throughout the scriptures, references to this harvest are replete and they, they, are, they are continual. Genesis 8 and 22, when the earth remaineth seed time and harvest and heat and cold summer and winter day and night shall not cease david said they that sow in tears shall reap in joy he that goeth forth bearing precious seed and weepeth shall doubtless come again rejoicing bringing his sheaves with him solomon said he that observeth the winds shall not sow he that regardeth the cloud shall not reap and that 
thou knowest not what is the way of the spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child, so thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. In the morning sow thy seed, and in the evening withhold not thy hand. Paul said to the church at Galatia, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth to his flesh shall reap of the flesh corruption. He that soweth to the Spirit shall reap of the Spirit life everlasting. He said to the church at Corinth, I plant and Apollos watereth, but God gave the increase. So then neither is it he that planteth anything, nor he that watereth, but God who giveth the increase. Hallelujah. In his second epistle to Corinth, he said, He that soweth sparingly shall reap sparingly. He that soweth bountifully shall reap bountifully. Jesus said, No man having put his shoulder to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom. Jesus said, Say not ye there are four months and then the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes. Look on the fields for they are white already <laughs> hallelujah if you're wondering when the time is right to do the work of God I'm going to tell you that's the word right now already when is the time to pray and fast already when is the time to evangelize already when is the time to witness already it's harvest time it's harvest time the grain is falling the spirit's calling do not wait. It's growing late. Behold, the fields are white. It's harvest time. Hallelujah. Jesus would say to them, listen, in the kingdom of God, if I could describe it to you in any way, I wish I could tell you the kingdom of heaven, it is, it is like a sower that went forth to sow. And, and he sowed indiscriminately just everywhere he went. He was throwing seed and some of the seed fell upon the side, the wayside. And some of the seed fell on uh, thorny ground. And some of the seed fell upon shallow ground. Oh, but some of the seed fell upon good ground. Hallelujah. And he didn't matter to him where it fell or how it responded. He's just going to throw seed everywhere he goes. That's actually where the term broadcast comes from. It is a casting abroad of the seed. It's time to take the seed and cast it wherever we can cast it. It's time to take the seed and throw it around. Throw it around. Drop it here. Drop it there. Drop it everywhere. Hallelujah. Cast it on the wayside. Cast it on the thorny ground. Cast it on the shallow ground. Huh? You don't get to decide where you throw the seed. You don't get to decide who's worthy to hear the gospel. You just cast the seed. You don't get to decide what kind of ground it is. Only the God of the harvest can say what kind of ground that's going to be. Oh, I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of good ground that we prejudged as shallow. There's a lot of good ground we prejudged as shallow and unable to receive. We prejudge too much ground saying it's too thorny, it's too prickly, it's teach it. You just sing it. You just pray. You just fast. The sower went forth. And I got to say this. The sower went forth to sow. He didn't go forth to reap. He went forth to sow. Paul said, I plant that sowing. Apollos watered. Hallelujah. But God gave the increase. You sow. That's our job. Sow. In the morning sow thy seed, and in the evening withhold not thy hand. Just sow the seed. Hallelujah. And, and he went on to say, just shortly after describing that, he said, if I could describe the kingdom uh, of, of God in, in, in any way, the kingdom of heaven, it's, it's, like, 
It's like a man that went and sowed seed in his field. He sowed good seed in his field. And, and then he went to sleep. And while men slept, an enemy came in and sowed, sowed uh, tares among the wheat. And, and the man woke up and said, where, where did these tares come from? His servants were saying, didn't you throw good seed in the field? He said, yes, I threw good seed in the field. They said, well, where did these tares come from? He said, an enemy hath done this. An enemy hath done this. He said, wait until the end at harvest time and take up the tares from the wheat. Let them be separated. Take the whole harvest, but separate the tares from the wheat. And, and he went on to say, I, I, if I could describe the kingdom of heaven in any way, I, I would tell you that it's, it's like a man who, who sowed a grain of mustard seed. He, he, he sowed a mustard seed, which is, which is the least of all seeds. The least of all seeds but but when it is grown it is the greatest of all herbs and the branches grow out and trees lot birds lodge in the branches of that tree this is the way that the lord would speak concerning his kingdom he said it's a harvest field he said there's a lot of sowing involved and there's a lot of watering involved there's a lot of planting involved and there's a lot of reaping involved. This is the way my kingdom operates. Mark chapter 4 and verse 26, he said, So is the kingdom of God. As if a man should cast seed into the ground and should sleep. Hallelujah. He should sleep and rise night and day and the seed should spring and grow up. He knoweth not how. I don't know how the seed is growing up. I don't know how someone is receiving the gospel. I don't know how they ever broke loose of those chains. I don't know how their marriage was ever healed. I don't know how they ever came through that trial or that crisis. But all I had to do was sow the seed should sleep and rise night and day and the seed should spring and grow up he knoweth not how for the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself first the blade then the ear after that the full corn in the ear but when the fruit is brought forth immediately he putteth in the sickle because the harvest is come immediately he putteth in the sickle rising night and day that's what the kingdom of heaven is like the kingdom of god is like a man who sows seed in the field and then rises night and day looking after that field and as soon as the fruit comes forth puts in the sickle because the harvest is come and i want you to know the harvest is here I see something special in this generation. I see something special in this generation. This is a God-ordained generation. You are not afraid of your culture. You are not intimidated by your culture. We look at this generation and this culture and we think, my goodness, this is the craziest, whacked out, weirdest thing I've ever seen. But you're not afraid of it because God has anointed you to evangelize it. Don't let this culture convert you. Be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Yeah. Yeah. There's something special. I see something in this generation that I saw in my grandfather's generation. There's a dedication. There's a consecration. There's a sacrifice. There's a willingness to sow the seed. There's a willingness to lay down, lay down your life. There's a willingness to put your heart and soul into the work of God. And that's so important because the harvest is come. It's time to put in the sickle because the harvest is come. In Matthew 9, 37 and 38, Jesus was looking at the multitudes and he began having compassion upon the multitudes 
as he was looking at them, he said, I, I see all of these people that are so, so sick and so wounded and so broken. And, and then as Brother Blackshear preached so beautifully at the conference this year, he saw them as sheep having no shepherd. And he was moved with compassion at those who were sheep having no shepherd. And as he began to be moved with compassion, he said, listen, he said, the harvest is truly plenteous. Don't you ever forget that. The harvest is truly plenteous. There are plenty of people who need Jesus. He said, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he send forth laborers. Let me tell you, the problem is not the harvest. The harvest is plenteous. And the problem is not the Lord of the harvest because he will participate in the harvest. The issue is the laborers. I submit to you there's a labor shortage. If I have to walk up to one more restaurant that I need to have open till 11 o'clock, I'm hungry. I got a whole host of people that are hungry that just came out of a red hot Holy Ghost revival meeting. And we need something to stay open till 11 o'clock. We'll tip you real good. But they can't because there's a labor shortage. The hungry can't be fed because there's a labor shortage. God forbid that the world come to the doors of the church because of COVID or whatever, there's a labor shortage. I'm sorry, we don't have enough people to teach you Bible studies. I'm sorry, we don't have enough people to pray for you. I'm sorry, there's nobody here willing to come in and sacrifice the time and put forth the effort. No, the issue is not the fields. The fields are white, all ready to harvest. And the issue is not the Lord of the harvest. He's ready. He's ready. He's willing. He's able. The issue is the laborers. The laborers. I need the laborers to enter into this harvest field. The laborers, hallelujah, laborers to start praying, laborers to start fasting, laborers to start consecrating, laborers to start teaching Bible studies, laborers, hallelujah, laborers. And when this book was written and this, this holy book was written, the kind of labor they had for the purpose of harvest was an ox. It was an ox. Now, today we have combines. But then they had oxen. They had John the Beloved. They had John the Baptist. They had John 316. But they didn't have John Deere. (laughs) The work of reaping was hard the work of sowing was grueling when the lord said in the morning sow thy seed he was he was talking to people with grizzled hands and and aching backs he was talking to people who had spent every morning sowing their seed when when he said if you sow sparingly, you will reap sparingly. If you reap so bountifully, you will reap bountifully. He was talking to people who knew the pain and the anguish of individually setting out along with what laborers they could hire to come and help them sow into a field that seemed insurmountable. And, and, and one of the ways that they had, one of the great inventions, great technologies that they had was, was an ox because the ox had been basically custom made for this purpose of harvesting, plowing, plowing the fields. No, they, they, 
it weren't, uh, they weren't just a, a bull. They, were, they had gone through surgical procedure in order to keep them from being aggressive and resisting the yoke. They had submitted to a surgical procedure that would prevent them from, from resisting too much. And it took years to get them yoked, trained to a yoke. It took a long time to get them under the burden of that yoke and get their attention off of what is going on out there and focus on the path in front of them and, and they would plod ahead the ox and they, they would plow great fields, large acreages of fields and they would put a yoke on them. If they resisted the yoke, it would, it would dig into their back and it would, it would begin to create wounds and injuries and, and, and injuries that would get infected and cause great hardship to them and, and even, even if they would not, would not submit to the yoke, the farmers would just have to Use them as beef and not as harvesting animals. That's the ox. The ox is a full-grown steer, a full-grown steer, and it's allowed to live to its, its great maturity and the strength of that thing. It's a term we use to describe the strongest people we know. If we see somebody that's really strong and we want to tell somebody how strong they are, we say they're strong as an ox. Because that's what it takes to reap the harvest that the Bible is talking about. You're not going to reap the harvest of Mark 4 with a combine. You're not going to reap the harvest of John 4 with, with John Deere. You're, you're not going to reap the harvest. This is the international harvester. It doesn't work in the Bible's concept of harvesting. In the Bible's concept of harvesting, we need those that are strong as an ox that can put their shoulder to the plow, that can come under the yoke necessary to take them through the long, arduous fields. And if you're going to try to shortcut your way to revival, it's not revival you'll end up at. If you're going to try to shortcut your way to miracle signs and wonders, it's not miracle signs and wonders where you'll end up. You're going to end up in some distant land where you know nothing of the God of the Bible, but you've got to come under his yoke. Oh, friend, but I've got news for you. If you will just come up under his yoke, his yoke is easy. The challenge you have is your rebellion, your stubbornness, your lack of submission. But if you come up under the yoke of God, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Ah. King Saul happened upon a sight, a scene, a scene where men were weeping. The Gileadites had just told the nation of Israel. They, because the Gileadites were a part, they believe, of the a half tribe of Manasseh. They were descendants of Manasseh. And they had been approached by the Ammonites that were going to conquer them. And they said, please do not kill us. They said, we will, we will spare your life if you let us pluck out your right eye. And we're going to show all of Israel who the Ammonites really are. It was, a, it was an act of cruelty. And it was something that was common in those days where a severe act of cruelty would, would be used in order to show anybody that dare think them to be weak not to make that mistake. And so they, they were saying, if you'll let us cut out your right eye. Well, that sounds like a terrible deal. Yeah. I don't know if I want this after all. I, you know, you just cut out your right eye and we'll be friends. With friends like that, I mean, my goodness. So Jabesh Gilead comes up onto the scene and they're like, listen, we've got good news and bad news. The good news is the Ammonites are willing to make peace. The bad news is that they're going to cut out our eyes. And, and that's, that's just no way to make peace. And so... King Saul comes up on the scene of them lamenting this terrible news. And, and, and the Bible says, now I know Saul was, he was a character. And I know Saul had his issues. And, and he was at a witch's house later in his life. And he resisted and rejected God later in his life. But, but in this moment, in the purity of his walk with God, and let me tell you something. Don't mistake thinking that you can be pure now and change later brother gore as he mentioned so beautifully yesterday you need to be committed now and forevermore 
There was a time when King Saul was anointed of God. And the Bible says that the Spirit of God came upon Saul. And his anger was greatly kindled. And he said, who do they think they are coming against the people of God? Who do they think they are, them coming against the people of Israel? But he had a problem. And the problem was that Israel was all segregated and separated and segmented into their tribes doing their own little thing and they didn't really care about the Gileadites let the Gileadites deal with what the Gileadites have to deal with I got my own stuff going on I've got my own issues that are taking place and I'm going to deal with what I need to deal with and Saul was looking for a way to wake them up and make them understand the dire nature of these circumstances. So the Bible said that in his great anger, and while the Spirit of God rested heavily upon him, under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, Saul took a yoke of oxen and divided them up, cut them asunder and began to divide up the yoke of oxen. And he began to carefully place them in little packages and mail them to each tribe of Israel. One day when those Amazon Prime packages showed up. Now, you know the joy that floods your soul when the Amazon Prime truck shows up. Amen. And brethren, if you can't relate, if you've got some women in the house, you just pay attention. If you hear a shout of glee, and the, you, you, it, it could very well be because Amazon Prime, FedEx, UPS showed up with whatever it was that they ordered. They may not even know what they ordered. <laughs> they, they don't even know what it was. It could be a variety of things that are currently on the, on the waiting list. But, but when it comes in and they open that package, they're going to be rejoicing with exceeding great joy for whatever it is. And so the Amazon Prime packages show up. And, and, and they're excited to see what came in the mail. But what to their wondering eyes did appear? But just a piece of bloody, mangled oxen. It was startling. Naphtali gets a, a hoof in the mail. Zebulon gets a, gets a horn in the mail. And, and Issachar, Issachar gets a, gets a right leg and a left leg in the, in the mail. And, and Asher, Asher gets, gets a, a, some kind of a brisket or something in the mail. They might have cooked that. They might have they just thrown that on the grill. But none of them had a whole ox. Every one of them got a piece of the ox but none of them got the whole ox and Saul was sending a message we're strong but we're divided we're powerful but we're not together we can do anything but we can't do anything we have the ability to take what God has given us, but not while we're segmented into our little borders and in our little places. Not when I'm looking after what's in my best interest. And this is what he said. He said, look, he sent a little note. It was a little note attached and said, you better come fight with us because there's an enemy on the border of Israel. And I don't care how safe you think you are because you're in Asher and you're not in Gilead. Because you're in Ne Zebulun and you're not in Gilead. I don't care how, think you, how safe you think you are. What you see in your mailbox right now is exactly what's going to happen to your yoke of oxen in your your barn and I've got news for somebody you can't sow discord in somebody else's field without reaping it in your own 
Don't you try to tear up what God is doing in his kingdom. Because the yoke of oxen in your own household will become divided. Never open up your mouth against the preacher. Never open up your mouth against the word of God. Never open up your mouth against your brother or your sister. Never open up your mouth. Listen, never open up your mouth against the least of these. You know, the one everybody's kicking around. Don't open your mouth. My God, we are a peculiar people. We don't act like the world. I know we don't dress like the world, but we also don't act like the world. And just because we don't dress like the world doesn't give us a license to act like the world. We don't get to act like the world. We are a peculiar people. We are a united people. You must be one with each other. Do not call yourself oneness if you are not one with each other. The oneness of God starts with the theology of God, but it culminates in the unity of the body. Sometimes we start dancing around the oneness of God. The oneness, and listen, I dance with everybody over the oneness of God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. But don't call yourself oneness if you're dividing the body. You're not oneness. You're not oneness. If you're dividing the body of Christ, you're not oneness. You're one ish. But you're not oneness. Uh, my savior said that they all may be one even as we are one his oneness gives us the empowerment to become one with each other And, and it has to be real it can't be fake You can't, listen, you can't put a fake smile on at a conference and then go talk about the people you just smiled at. No, it's got to be real. It's got to be real. I said it's got to be real. You need to fear God too much to raise your voice against your brother. When you raise your voice against your brother, you're carving off a piece of the ox. Brother Robinette, you'll say it here in a minute. I'm I'm guaranteed that you will. You've said it all week long. And I heard it. My spirit heard it. Billions. Billions. Have you heard him say it? Billions. I looked over at Brother Elms and I said, Brother Robinette is speaking that into existence. He's declaring it into existence. Billions. And Brother Elms responded and said, Well, I know God came to save billions. He said, I know Jesus died for billions. Why not billions? But I'm going to tell you something. If we want to reap a harvest of billions, we've got to be strong as an ox. We've got to be strong as an ox. Oh my God. Now I'm going to tell you what the Lord spoke to me this week concerning this. And I'm just going to tell you. I felt the Lord speak to me saying, I'm done with division. I will judge those who divide. He's thrusting in his sickle. He's thrusting in his sickle. Don't be a tear. Because the separation is starting. The separation is starting. He's done with it. You and I had better be done with it. No, we don't get the luxury of being offended anymore. Those days are gone. Well, you don't know what they said about you. I don't care what they said. You don't get to be offended anymore. You don't get to. It's over. We've got a harvest. We've got a field to plow. 
We've got fields to plow. We need the ox. We need every part of this ox. No, Naphtali, you don't get to hoard your part of the body over within your borders. We need the whole ox. <laughs> Unity. Behold, how good, how pleasant. I want my children and my grandchildren. I want them to be given the gift of a united Pentecostal church international. I want them to walk into every meeting they walk into and say, I'm home. I'm with the brethren. I'm with my sisters. I'm with, I'm with the family of God. And we love each other. And listen, if there's a passive aggressive a mark or if there's a snide comment, doesn't matter. I'm done with division. I love you anyway. I forgive you. You don't even have to ask me for forgiveness anymore. I forgive you. You want to know why? You want to know why? Because Jesus gave us a new commandment, Brother Morgan. He gave us a new commandment. He said, you've heard that you should love your neighbor as yourself. But I bring a new commandment. And the new commandment is, you need to love each other like I love you. And here's the problem. You don't know how much he loves you. You're not at the cross enough. You're not at the cross enough. When you're at the cross, you see he loves you. And when you know that he loves you, you're able to love people like he loves you. The reason I can't be offended is because God, Brother Kyle, has refused to be offended at me. I don't deserve to stand here today. I don't deserve it. I'm not just saying that. I don't deserve to be in this pulpit. I don't deserve to be in this house. I don't deserve to be in his presence. I am absolutely 100% unworthy. And yet when I walk into this house, this holy presence of the almighty God has surrounded me. Oh, I have to love people the way he has loved me. I have to win. Welcome people the way he has welcomed me. I had a good friend. I had a good friend who said some bad things about me. I knew it. It came back to me. It was verified. I knew it. I knew it happened. And, and, and so what? So what? I'm still their friend. They're still my friend. And somebody, knowing the situation, said, how can you be friends with them after what they said? And I said, I, I don't know, but I, all I can tell you is I love them. And I don't care what they said. I don't. I don't care. They were probably frustrated or maybe worse yet. They just don't like me. I don't know. But, but they might be fake. They might be dealing with some hypocrisy. I don't know. I'll pray God gives them the victory. But I love them. That's not Joel's love. That's the love of God. That's an agape love. And we better get baptized with it if we want to reap billions. We hold forgiveness like it's leverage. I might talk to you if you start acting better. I might, I might encourage you if you start acting nicer. No, no, no. That's forgiveness is not your leverage. Forgive. Oh my God. Freely you have received. Freely you have received. Have you forgotten how much mercy you needed? Have you forgotten how much mercy you needed? Have you forgotten how you shouldn't be here? You shouldn't just be dead and in your grave. You should be dead and in hell. But God, who is rich in mercy. Forgiveness isn't mine. Forgiveness is God's. Do you know what the word for gave? Just invert it. Gave for. 
That's what he did. He gave for it. I forgave it because he gave for it. They offended me, but they don't owe me anything. Yeah, they do. There's a debt, but it's a debt they can't pay. They can't pay it. What are they going to do? Undo the damage? They can't. Jesus paid it all. He already gave for it. Don't worry about it. Because I remember when I was ignorant and arrogant and broken and bitter and saying stuff I should have never said and having feelings I should have never harbored. He gave for it. So forget about it. (laughs) He already gave for you. Can we put, I want to put a, a verse of scripture. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. I, I need to put a verse of scripture. It's, it's a real obscure one. We need to, if you could get ready. I don't know if you guys have ever heard this scripture before. Uh, it's in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 38. Could you put that up on the screen real quick? I want to go real deep. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of Many times when we quote it and don't read it, we put the word your before sins for the remission of your sins. And that's not what the Bible says. For the remission of sins. You want to know why it doesn't put the word your there? Because it's not just remitting your sins. It is washing away your sins and every other sin that has ever or will ever be committed against you. When I come up out of the waters of baptism in Jesus' name, all my sins are washed away. And every unclean, ungodly, offensive thing that was ever done to me, that's washed away at the same time. Listen. If you go down in those waters and you think you come up forgiven for your sins, but you're going to hold everybody else accountable for theirs, you have taken the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Because we forgive our debtors as we forgive, as we are forgiven, we forgive our debtors. Behold, how good, how pleasant. It is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like the precious ointment. The precious ointment that Brother Green preached about, that Brother Bounds preached about, that oil, that precious ointment. Do you know what that ointment is? Everything in that ointment is crushed. Everything. And that's what unity is like. Unity isn't me and you deciding on what we can agree to or disagree upon. No, it's not me trying to pick what parts of my speculation and opinions I can do without and which ones I I could never do without. No, no. That's not what it's about. Unity is about me completely dying. And you completely dying. And Jesus completely dying. And us being cast into him. That's the precious ointment. The base of the ointment is the olive oil. And that olive oil started flowing in the garden of Gethsemane when Jesus said, not my will, but thy will be done. But there's other ingredients that go in that ointment. The other ingredients are also crushed. They're ground down to powder, to seasonings. And they're, they're taken and they're thrown in to that base of olive oil. The other ingredients are when Joel in Cincinnati says, Not my will, but thy will be done. And Brother Elms in Fort Lauderdale says, Not my will, but thy will be done. And Brother Carson in Indianapolis says, Not my will, but thy will be done. And Brother Wells in Titusville says, Not my will, but thy will be done. And all of you say, Not my will, but thy will be done. And each of us are crushed. Each of us are broken. Each of us are ground down. And we're all poured into Christ.
Christ. In Christ the promises of God are yea and amen. It's in Christ that we sit together in heavenly places. It's in Christ that we are new creatures. All things are passed away. All things are become new. It's in Christ that there's no condemnation. Unity is in Christ. <laughs> Hallelujah. Unity is in Christ. Let not the eye say to the ear, I have no need of you. Yes, you do. We have a harvest to reap. We have fields to plow. We have seed to sow. And we can't do it unless we're strong as an ox. I'm coming to a close. Our musicians could come. Thank you. I'm coming to a close. I remember glory, Pastor Myers. I remember glory in our midst that was so palpable. And we've talked about it. Elders, elders, you know what I'm talking about. Glory. Pastor Myers alluded to it yesterday. He said, don't leave. Linger in his presence. And, and, and I'm not saying that there was ever an Ichabod moment. I don't believe there was. But I, I do think sometimes as years go by, we start to forget how beautiful the glory is. And if we're not careful, we, we could let lamps go out that need to burn continually. And if we're not careful, we can let the ark of God be taken that, that God gave as a gift to us. That ark hoisted upon the shoulders of the priest as they held those staves in that ark they, they cut off the Jordan River with that ark the priests but when that ark came back to Israel it was on a new cart and it wasn't carried by priests it was carried by oxen and I know, it, it, probably, it probably should have been carried by priests. I get it. I've preached that. But it wasn't. It was carried by oxen. And I want you to know that this revival, this harvest that's coming, that's here already, it's not going to be born upon the shoulders of your favorite preachers. It's going to be carried by a unified body that is strong as an ox. And, and, be, and listen, listen, be careful because there are going to be moments when it gets a little shaky. There are going to be moments where you think, oh no, 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 it can't be like that because we got, and you're trying to steady the glory. Pull your hand back. Don't try it. Don't try it. Let God be God. Don't make the mistake of user and try to fix what God is doing. All you got to do is get in the flow, get in the river, get the oil. Hallelujah. Let the breath of God come into the bones of man. Find out where the wind is blowing. Get your hands in the dirt of ministry. Let a second wind envelop your lungs and come together. Knit together as one man strong, as an ox able, able to plow the field, sow the seed, and reap the harvest of billions that God is bringing to His kingdom. Could you lift your hands right now? Here's what I want us to do if we could. Because I'm going to tell you something. There's a lot of flesh involved. I want people to come to the front of this house right now who say, God, please forgive me for seeking my own. Please forgive me for seeking limelight. Please forgive me for feeling offended. Listen, I'm not trying to put you under any kind of false guilt. It's normal to feel offended. I, I'm not, to, it's flesh. It's normal. But we are not normal. We are people who are peculiar. We're not divided by age. We're a chosen generation. We're not divided by ethnicity. We're a holy nation. We're not divided even by our individualities. We're a peculiar people. And we're not divided by, by spiritual status. We are a royal priesthood. 
But I want us, before we go any further today, to each of us lay down ourselves before the Lord. Say, God, please forgive me for feeling offended. Please forgive me. Help me. Help me. Help my feelings. Help me to feel the way I'm supposed to feel. Help me to wait patiently on you. Help me to put my shoulder to the plow. Help me to be obedient. Help me to hear your spirit. Help me to love my brother. Help me to forgive those who have wounded me with their words. Help me. I will tell you, if we all start doing this, (laughs) if we all start doing this, We're going to come together strong as an ox. And we're going to plow fields. We're going to sow seed. And we're going to reap harvest. (laughs) Come on, every one of us, myself included. We have to reach out to God. Lord, I don't know how to be one with my brother. Help me be one with my brother. I don't know how to love people who have hurt me. Help me to love people who have hurt me. I don't know how to bless those who persecute me. I don't know how to love my enemies. I don't know how to pray for them which despitefully use me. Help me, Lord. Help me. They'll break you down and pour you into the precious ointment of unity.